The girls sleep, and Free Run reminisces about how Hyder used to say that every party needs something or someone different. Meanwhile, Fern's party has already caught Ashtila. Now they just have to keep it caged and to themselves until time's up. The following morning, Kana and Lavina go over what they've learned about the bird. Now that they know the what, all they need is the how. And it looks like Free Run's got that covered. The spell she used the night before to save Kana from that feathered beast was devised by hunters to catch birds, a folk spell. And if it worked on that monster, it should be more than enough to capture the supersonic Stilla. The only problem is its range, half a meter. They need to be close enough to touch it. Elsewhere, Fern's party hides out in a cave. But after running out of water, they decide to venture forth to quench their thirst. They only find dried up riverbeds, and Fern deduces that the barrier is keeping any new water from entering the testing area. All they've got is what's already in there, which has mostly run off to the lake. Before they can continue on their way, they're ambushed by another party lying in wait to steal their bird. Eighth Party, Verbal Sharf Era. Suddenly, a giant glowing pillar erupts towards the sky in the distance above the lake, which gets everyone's attention. Lavina hovers above the water as the pillar dissipates. The lake freezes from the center outwards. The other party's plans to catch Ashtila stopping for a quick drink are sunk. The 13th party, Dankin, Richter, and Laufen, wonder what the second party is up to. Now that the lake is frozen, their best chance is to simply steal a caged bird from another. Lavina books it away from the lake, and Kana explores the territory for every small body of water she can find, putting the second phase of their plan into motion. Dankin decides it's best to search for the second party, and on the way, they discover another party's bodies ravaged by the same beasts that attacked Kana. He cautions his comrades against laying them to rest, since the creatures mark their kills with their mana and would notice if they were disturbed. It's one of their methods for finding new prey. When they come upon another pool, Richter and Laufen can't detect the faint traces of mana, unlike Dankin. He figures that the second party has been marking all but one watering hole to funnel any thirsty Stilla to the same spot. The birds are sensitive to mana and do their best to avoid it. And he's right. Freeren sits near a pond and conceals her mana so completely it astonishes the girls. They hide behind some trees, while Freeren waits by the lake with the stillness of a meditating monk. Some time later, a few orange feathers fall before the elf's face, and a Stilla lands on her shoulder. But as soon as she uses the spell to capture the bird, Dankin detects her mana. Meanwhile, Fern fends off Era of the Eighth Party. Ada tells her that she'll have a tough time facing Verbal with her outdated magic. It's as if someone's grandmother taught her, and she's kinda right. Fern is completely unfazed by her boastings and warnings. Regardless of the simplicity of her offensive magic, even one of the most powerful mages can't defend against the sheer number of spells she can fire off at once, and her opponent is overwhelmed in a matter of moments. Verbal uses a binding spell to immobilize Ubel, and asks her politely to hand over their Stilla. She quickly realizes that for his spell to work, he needs to have full view of her body and can't use it on multiple targets. He releases her. Given an opening, she throws the cage to distract his gaze and lunges, aiming for his eyes, only just missing as he evades her blow. He restrains her once more, but hesitates to finish her off. She taunts him, not used to killing women and children. On the contrary, when he wasn't fighting demons, he was a mercenary, and using women and children as fodder wasn't so uncommon in wars between rival nations. She tells him that a person's magic says a lot about who they are. A restraining spell indicates a disdain for killing. She's right, but it does give him a moment to mentally prepare to carry out the deed, and it's time to say goodbye. Shock flashes across Verbal's face. Fern's staff is pointed directly at his head. A mage who can conceal their mana completely? He can't believe that she's already taken care of Era, but it makes sense that she'd be the one to catch Ashtila. He asks what's become of his party member, and without hesitation, Fern tells him she's dead. Verbal gives up and walks away. There's no point if a party member dies. The win condition requires all three to survive. 
it's time to go and find Sharf. He thinks he's got the battle in the bag. After all, he's been able to land multiple hits using a spell that turns flower petals into metal projectiles that he can control. But Lond has just been biding his time, discerning the type and scope of Sharf's magic without engaging. Once his opponent is assured of his victory, the illusion is broken. The man he thought he was fighting evaporates. It was an illusion the whole time. Lond grabs Sharf's throat from behind and casts a single spell, knocking his opponent out cold. Verbal comes upon Ada on the ground, alive. Taking note of the destruction Fern left in her wake, he realizes the girl is more monster than child. His comrade can't move, so he uses levitation magic to carry her, but succumbs to her insistence on more dignified transportation. Piggyback. They find Sharf in a similar state, so Verbal carries them both. Ada asks if Verbal's kindness is what drove him to fight demons but it turns out that it was just some silly promise to a girl he had a crush on as a child. As they continue their walk of shame, Edda notices a shtilla roosting in a tree above them. Verbal catches it using his restraining spell. Elsewhere, Duncan and Richter square up against Freeren and her party, their shtilla stolen by Laufen using a speed spell. When Richter threatens to kill the children, Freeren asks why he would go to such lengths for a certification. It turns out that Zedia, an elf, devised the ranking system to grant first-class mages the privilege, knowledge of any spell within her repertoire, and apparently she's practically a walking grimoire. Mages forfeit their humanity just for the chance. Duncan tells Richter not to kill the girls while he keeps their babysitter busy. Freeren remembers meeting Zedia back when she was Flama's apprentice. When offered any spell she desired, she turned it down. The pursuit of magic is far more appealing. This answer displeased the powerful elf, but Flama assured her that Freeren would be the one to defeat the Demon King, a mindset of peace and not war. Richter uses a spell to split the battlefield, while Denkin muses that the privilege isn't what a mage should desire. He's of the same mind as Freeren. The pursuit is far more precious. Richter sends a barrage of attacks using his earth magic, all the while lecturing the girls about the limits of their own. Modern magic uses the manipulation of matter to fight. Since protection magic was devised to block offensive magic, using it against physical attacks is far less effective and too energy consuming. He overwhelms them. But Lavina starts to taunt him. He wouldn't have separated Kana from a water source if he wasn't afraid. Apparently though, he has nothing to fear. Well, depending on how things go down below with Denkin and Freeren. Freeren continues her relentless assault, draining Denkin's mana. If he doesn't finish this now, he'll run out before long. Using debris from the ground, the old timer creates a sand cyclone and sets it aflame. From a great distance, the exam proctors witness the display. One wonders if it's enough to break the barrier, while the other scoffs. But there is one mage who's been analyzing the barrier since last night. No matter. Does she actually believe there's a mage more powerful than Zadia? The confidence drains from Denkin's face as his spell dissipates to reveal a totally unharmed elf still soaring above the ground. So he sends a barrage of light arrows her way, which are only sideswiped by a basic attack spell, and he's out of mana. She beat him with simple offensive magic, like it was a sparring match between a master and a young apprentice, him being the apprentice. Freeren calls out to Laufen, threatening to kill the old timer unless she returns the Stilla. Dankin warns her not to move, she'll give her position away. Freeren readies an attack spell aimed right at his head, and she falls for it. Bird in hand, she leaves the two in the bush, or restrained to a tree at least. Laufen asks why this is so important to Dankin. He confesses that he just wants to visit a grave and needs the certification to travel in the northern lands. Denkin expresses some concern about the girls up on the plateau with Richter. Freeren tells him that they don't need her help, not directly. She then readies a spell and dispels the barrier. What was that about Kana being cut off from water? The rain falls upon them. Lavina freezes Richter in place while Kana quickly takes him out, overpowering him with her water attacks. Denkin and his party decide to look for another party to steal a Stilla from. 
they find two members of a party who lost their third to the beasts. Though irrationally, they're still clinging to their caged bird. And since they're all out of mana, it's down to good old fisticuffs. The sun sets. Six parties, 18 mages, move on to the next stage. At a bar in the city, Stark drinks alone. He can stay up late and do whatever he wants. That is, until the following morning, or afternoon, when Fern knocks on the door with Free Ren in tow. He gets chewed out by the young mage, and she spits a little venom Free Ren's way while she's at it. Free Ren decides to try to cheer her up by taking them all to a restaurant she went to last time she passed through the city. Elsewhere, after Richter helps out his grandmother at his magic shop, Denken and Laufen pass by. The old man invites him to have dinner with them and asks about a restaurant he visited with his wife many years ago. The merchant thinks he knows it and reluctantly agrees to join them. Meanwhile, Lond is ambushed by Ubel in the streets. Despite his disdain for her, she continues to follow him, expressing interest in getting to know him. After she explains her interaction with Verbal, she uses his restraining spell to stop Lond in his tracks. Apparently, if she can relate to someone, she can figure out how to cast their spells. Lond is unmoved by her attempts to get under his skin, and is put off by her lack of technical understanding of the magic she uses. She's merely copying the spells, which is rich coming from him. She lets him go after claiming to see a glint of who he truly is, and proceeds to follow him around. Richter leads his former party members to the restaurant that Denken described, and even commends his superb taste. When they enter, they see Free Rend and company in there, already looking at the menu, and decide not to bother them. When Free Ren was there with the heroes, they helped the chef get his heirloom knife back from demons. From that day, he vowed that in a hundred years, the food would still hold up to the same quality. But when she takes a bite, she's disappointed that the chef didn't keep his word. But in fact, the food has improved, and this puts a smile on her face. Even Ubel and Hermark land at the same restaurant. The following day, Stark meditates on a cliff as an elderly man shares his wisdom and commends the kid on his training. Freeran appears and asks who that guy was. Stark has no clue. The guy's just been watching him train. Weird, but whatever. She needs Stark's help. Fern is in a foul mood, and it's Free Ren's fault. Looks like he's trading meditation for mediation. The one clear path to Fern's forgiveness is through her stomach, so Stark suggests they all go out and get some snacks. In the streets, Verbal and Scharf are in search of a warrior, manhandling any passerby who resembles one. Kana watches this from a balcony above, and Lavina shows up, ready for their day of shopping. At a sweet shop, the two of them stumble on Free Running Company and tag along. Just when Stark laments having to shop with the four of them, Verbal and Sharf appear. Looking him over, they find that he'll do just fine and cart him away to help on some job. The girls thank Free Ren for helping them pass the test, which reminds her of Himmel's penchant for helping others. Seeing how happy they are puts a smile on her face. However, their moment is interrupted when a bird swoops in and drops instructions regarding their next test. The girls are disheartened upon hearing who the proctor is. Fern doesn't understand and asks why. Apparently, Zensa has only ever proctored four tests, and nobody has ever passed them. The 18 mages meet at the entrance to the tomb where the test is taking place. Zensa is aware of her own notoriety but assures them it won't be a difficult trial for a first-class mage. However, they should listen to the instructions carefully. They must conquer the king's tomb, a labyrinth, simply by making it to the bottom floor to pass. Zensa's a pacifist and doesn't want to incite violence, but it is true that many adventurers haven't made it out alive, so she gives everyone a golem in a bottle. If they find themselves in serious trouble, they can shatter the bottle and the golem will whisk them out. They'll fail, but they'll survive. If they don't make it by daybreak tomorrow, their bottles will shatter automatically, and they will fail. Denken argues for teamwork, but most mages decide to team up with people they already trust from the first trial. Freeren and Fern enter the tomb together, piquing the proctor's interest. She has a sense that they'll have an easier time and decides to accompany them, offering neither aid nor hindrance, a passive observer. Freeren intuits the best route, and advises Fern to map it out as they go. 
As she explains Himmel's love for dungeons, she warns their third wheel about a trap she nearly triggered. So much for not being a hindrance. Anyhow, Himmel relished their time exploring every corner of every floor of every dungeon. And now, so does Free Ren. Lavina and Kana get tired of waiting for... I'm actually not that sure what they were waiting for, but they finally decide to head into the dungeon together. Richter and Dankin agree that it would be foolish not to pair up, so they also enter its depths, along with Laufen and two other mages. Meanwhile, Freerun spots a chest and is intrigued. There could be a grimoire in there. Fern used a spell to detect whether it's a trap, a mimic, and according to the spell, it is. But the spell is only 99% accurate, so you're saying there's a chance. Freerun goes for it and gets the result she deserves. Dankin's group avoids one trap only to fall into another. Gargoyles spring to life and attack the mages. In the fray, one of the younger party members gets flung into a room with spiked walls that start closing in on either side. Because every good architect knows that that's an essential feature for any dungeon labyrinth. After dealing with the stone creatures, Dankin attempts to free her, but can't break down the wall. She has no choice but to use the golem. Upon breaking the bottle, the thing springs to life, scoops her up, breaks through the wall, and hauls ass out of there. Very effective. Freerun gets free from the mimic, and they continue through the dungeon with ease. As they near the bottom level, they decide to stop for a rest in the next burial chamber. Freerun goes through their pile of junk they've collected on the way, while Zensa initiates conversation with Fern. She finds it odd that she doesn't detect any determination or drive in the young mage. Fern tells her that she only became one to pay off a debt to someone. Her determination ran out after she accomplished her goal. But she has somehow become able to share in the joy Free Ren exudes in collecting useless magical artifacts. Somewhere deep within the labyrinth, a sort of seal breaks. Sharf senses a change in the atmosphere. Verbal thinks they're nearing the bottom, when suddenly Anna is restrained by his spell. Three mages are concealing their mana an ambush. Sharf throws up a metal pedal shield to break eye contact and free Ada. The dust settles to reveal three stone doppelgangers of themselves. Verbal tells Sharf to take him out. Ada is on Sharf, and he'll take her on. In another chamber, a copy of Laufen attacks Denkin's party. After dispatching it, the old mage ponders whether a demon or monster created the fake. At least it was easy to spot, so friendly fire shouldn't be an issue. Entering the next chamber reveals another copy hovering in the center. This one may be a problem. It's Free Ren. Richter seriously questions whether they'll be able to beat the copy. And if it wasn't a trial, Denkin admits he would have already smashed his bottle. In the city, the other proctors discuss the test over tea. Spiegel, the lord of the dungeon, or the water mirror fiend, existed since the mythical era. It's believed capable of reading the memories of any who wander into the labyrinth, and not only create replicas in appearance, but put to use all the target's skill, experience, and mana. No wonder the dungeon is unconquered. Underground, trapped in a hallway, Lond sits against a wall bleeding out, and enduring Ubel running her mouth, while her replica waits around the corner. She asks the cloning specialist what he thinks, since their exits are blocked, and the initial attack was more concerned with stealing the golem bottle than dealing a death blow. It's safe to assume that it does indeed contain her memories and personality, especially now that it's holding back, fully aware that Ubel's got a powerful binding spell she leached off verbal, but it's also just as likely she's torturing them for fun. Ubel asks whether she's talking to his copy. He doesn't give a direct answer. She then offers him her golem. He declines, but can't stop her from rushing headfirst into battle to retrieve his. They quickly close the gap, using their staffs to stave off the other. Their movements sync up, mirroring one another's attacks. The battle comes down to luck. Whoever can fire off the binding spell first wins, and it looks like her luck just ran out. The replicas, that is. As soon as Ubel is restrained, the double doors behind them burst open distracting the replica and freeing Ubel up to put an end to her stone copy. She picks up the bottle. Even it's an illusion. Lond asks why she would risk her life despite knowing he was a clone the whole time. 
She figures he doesn't want anyone's blood on his hands, and his refusing of her bottle only confirmed her suspicions. She still can't empathize with him enough to learn his cloning spell yet, so he's still stuck with her, for now. Elsewhere, Freerun stops her companions, convinced there's a secret room they missed on the first pass. She's right. At the top of the stairs, they find a well-preserved mural from the Unified Dynasty era, depicting the long-dead king's achievements, a rare and important discovery. Seeing Fern's wonder puts a smile on Freerun's face. They continue on and stumble upon Duncan, Richter, Laufen, and Matoda waiting around. Looking through a crack in the chamber door, Freerun sees her replica. Finally, things just got interesting. Richter proposes restraint or hypnosis magic would be their best bet. She's resistant to both, but it might be enough of a distraction to create an opening. Matoda has some skill with these things, so she evaluates real Freerun's capacity to resist both kinds of magic. Yeah, it's not gonna work. Perhaps a specialist would be able to overcome the elf's outdated defenses. Adel, a second-class mage among the test takers, might have a chance. The catch is, the replica would need a mind. Not to mention they have no idea where Adel is. Holed up with two other mages hiding from a replica of Zensa, Adel counts the ways by which they don't stand a chance. Since modern attack magic uses resources from the environment, they don't have much to work with. And Adel isn't even a fighter. They should probably just throw in the towel. The other two argue for her to try her hypnosis magic. It'd be tricky. It requires eye contact. And just like Matoda's doubts, Adel isn't sure whether there's a mind in there to hypnotize. The replica senses their presence and attacks, breaking through their defensive magic with ease. Adel manages to lock eyes with the replica and commands it to kneel. A spear-like tendril of Zensa's hair pierces the center of her chest, bringing her to her knees. It doesn't have a mind after all. Adel tells her companions to run, breaks her bottle, and escapes in the golem's arms. Verbal and company continue to battle themselves. Though formidable opponents, he's confident that he can crush anyone. Meanwhile, Fern speaks up. She might be able to kill Freerun. This declaration piques the elf's interest. Time to strategize. Thank you for sticking until the end. Subscribe for more videos like this.